Here's where we left off. We were talking about gene mutations, and now we know that there are multiple types of gene mutations. Gene mutations are always mistakes that have been incorporated into the DNA. And once they're incorporated into the DNA, they are going to be permanent, but they don't all have the same effect. We've learned that frame shift mutations are when you put an extra nucleotide in or take a nucleotide out. And in that case, you will change not only that um, codon, but all of the ones afterwards, right? We learned that frame shift mutations are almost always catastrophic because they change so much. Then we learned about point mutations. And with point mutations, it is a single nucleotide that's been substituted. It's been switched. So instead of a U, there's a C in this example. And we learned that even though a point mutation is a mutation and does change a codon, it does not always change the protein that will be made from that particular gene. And we were about to talk about why. It's because the genetic code is described as degenerate. Uh, degeneracy of the genetic code sounds like a value judgment, but it's not. It actually describes the way um, life with a capital L has evolved this particular system. So I think you, I told you that there are 64 unique codons. If you make, if you make three letter combinations of these four nucleotides, you can make 64 unique codons. And here they are, UUU, UCU, uh, ACC, 64 of them. Now, one of them is for start and three of them are for stop, all right? But that leaves us with 60. And I think I told you earlier in our lectures that if a committee was doing this, they would have said, great, there are 60 codons left. We've got 20 amino acid, it's three each, done, okay? But that's not the way it happened. It turns out that there are some amino acids whose side groups are difficult to replace. And because there are some side groups that are difficult to replace, it is particularly important that gene mutations don't affect those. Let me give you an example. Here we've got four codons for arginine, and here we've got two more codons for arginine. Instead of three codines, which would be kind of like its fair share, arginine gets six. That's because its side group is very special. And if that side group is not there, it is very likely to erase, to erase, to change the functioning of the protein. So life makes it so that if uh, a codon is supposed to say CGU, but there's a mistake and instead of CGU, it gets changed to CGG, well, it's still gonna be an arginine, protein's fine, life is fine, no one cares, right? If it's supposed to say CGC, but instead it says AGG, right? Again, still an arginine, no one cares, right? So that's what's really clever. I told you that this whole system with all of its complexity is designed to solve problems. How to make copies quickly and easily without making mistakes how to catch mistakes before they become permanent, before they become mutations, and if there is mutations, how to minimize the impact of those mistakes. There you go, the degeneracy of the genetic code. Now, on your exam, you're going to have to be able to decode some of the uh, uh, messages that are on the exam. So let's have a look at that. Okay. You're going to need to be able to use a genetic code chart like this one. The most important thing that you should remember starting out is that um, this is a messenger RNA codon chart. That is not a DNA codon chart, and that is not an anti-codon chart. Could I make one of those? Sure. Super easy. But that's not what this is. This is a messenger RNA codon chart. So you can only decode messenger RNA, right? If I gave you DNA that said AAA, how would you use this chart? 
If you go here and you find AAA and lysine, that is not the right answer, okay? Why? Because if I gave you DNA that says AAA, this is not a DNA codon chart. So you would have to transcribe the DNA, and if you transcribe it, it would be UUU, and the answer would be phenylalanine, okay? That's number one. Number two, number two, if I give you, let's say I don't give you DNA, let's say I give you messenger RNA. If I give you messenger RNA, don't transcribe messenger RNA. Life does not transcribe messenger RNA. If I give you messenger RNA, this is a messenger RNA chart, you will go right here, right? So if you're taking my exam, and if you're like, I know how to use this chart and the answer is just not there, probably this is what you're doing. If you take the DNA that I give you and transcribe it again, you will get the wrong answer, okay? This is a messenger RNA codon chart. Make sure that you can do it. So if I gave you the DNA, TCG, first you transcribe it because messenger RNA codon chart, AGC. So A is the first letter. Everything here, the first letter of the codon is A, all right? Then you go to the second letter, second letter is G. So these four codons, the first letter of all of them is AG. Now we need to know the last one. The last one, the third letter is C. So the correct answer is serine, all right? That's all you gotta do. Yes, the code is degenerate, and that is why even though you and I have got different DNA, we could each be making an absolutely perfect and identical protein to the other. Which one of us has the mutation? Probably me. I don't know. Doesn't matter, okay? But frame shift mutations, uber bad. By the way, I keep meaning to mention this, but uh, sickle cell anemia is a point mutation. Yeah, sometimes point mutations can be bad. And then point mutation with sickle cell anemia, it is the second letter that is mutated and it turns, I think it does this. Anyway, there are times when you can have a point mutation and it only changes a single letter, but if this goes from C, A, G, A, G to G, C, G, well, you've completely changed things. And that's what sickle cell anemia does. And in that case, it's enough to, to create a fatal problem. Fatal in the absence of modern medicine, not fatal with it. All righty, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, the rough endoplasmic reticulum makes special proteins. What's special about them? Most of them are destined to leave the cell. Either they will be spit out of the cell to go into the area around the cell or into the bloodstream, like insulin. Insulin's made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it's a protein. Either that or it's a protein that becomes a part of the cell membrane, either way. So how does a ribosome know, oh, this protein I make and it just goes out, or this protein I make and I need to go down onto the rough endoplasmic reticulum? And the answer is, um, when proteins need to be made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, then about the first 30 amino acids, they are hydrophobic amino acids. Remember I told you the 20 different amino acids, their side groups are different, right? Okay. Those 30 um, hydrophobic amino acids uh, gets attracted to the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and that actually draws the ribosome there so that the rest of the protein gets made down inside of the right rough endoplasmic reticulum. Ultimately, these 30 amino acids, this is called the hydrophobic leader sequence. It gets removed because um, the protein doesn't need them, but um, that's what targets the ribosome and the creation of that protein so that it's down inside of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So it kind of looks like this. Uh, the ribosome is reading the messenger RNA and there's this uh, hydrophobic leader sequence that gets attracted here to um, a uh, pore in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. 
And then the rest of the protein gets made and here in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, so that, that's how it happens. And then the rough endoplasmic reticulum kind of blows a big bubble gum bubble that's gonna be filled with different proteins and they get walked by a protein to the Golgi apparatus for packing and shipping, extra modification. Proteins uh, do not get used up um, if they're enzymes or other things, they don't get used up very quickly. However, they're not um, eternal. They, they do end up needing to go to the great ribosome in the sky or whatever, okay? Um, and uh, regulatory proteins, they, they get degraded really quickly, but all proteins will end up getting degraded at some point. However, they really are recycled. Um, when a protein is starting to get a little bit um, craggy looking, it gets tagged by a molecule called ubiquitin, and that marks them to be sent to a proteasome. A proteasome is a special uh, vesicle inside of the cell. And it's in there that special proteases are gonna digest the proteins. So if it's made out of different amino acids, we'll call them one, two, three, and four, the protease, the protease that, um, that digests the amino acids, it just cuts them apart. So now these amino acids, they actually can be used to make a new protein, right? So the protein got destroyed but all of its individual parts got recycled and now could be part of an entirely different enzyme or protein. All of these cells have got the same DNA inside of them, but of course they're not identical. You should recognize that these are simple cuboidal epithelial cells from the urinary tubules, maybe proximal convoluted tubule, that this is skeletal muscle cells. They're super different. These are, um, chondrocytes in hyaline cartilage, they got the same DNA, but they're not identical. And why is that? And that is because of transcriptional regulation. Transcription is which proteins, which messenger RNAs get made. Whatever genes get transcribed, those are the proteins that get made. This, um, this muscle cell is, bis those nuclei are busy transcribing muscle proteins. So the ribosomes in those cells make actin and myosin and all of those good proteins. These cells, the chondrocytes, they don't make actin, well, they do make actin. They don't make myosin. Um, they don't make tropomyosin. It's not that they don't have a gene for it. They do, but they have no need for it. So their nucleus does not transcribe those messenger RNAs. So that cell does not make those proteins. And in short, that is called gene expression. Gene expression is the same thing as transcriptional regulation. Which genes get expressed, which means which genes show up as proteins in that cell, depends on what messenger RNA gets transcribed. Gene expression, transcriptional regulation. This is a little more detail than I'm going to ask you about in the exam. Um, but uh, you will know, learn more about it when you take microbiology if you're a pre-nursing student. Um, the DNA that is found inside of your cells, when you were only one cell big, it was all available so that any of those genes could be transcribed. But as your cells became specialized cells, like as a cell becomes a skin cell or a muscle cell, the genes that are not necessary for what they do, they will get packed away in a special little condensed areas, and then they are not available to be transcribed, so those proteins will not be made. The ones that are in these open regions are the ones that can be transcribed, and that is part, but not all of, transcriptional regulation. So make sure you practice doing complementary DNA and RNA. So if I asked you, here is your DNA sequence, make the complement 
you can do that, right? Because the complementary strand of DNA would just be following the binding rules of complementarity. But if I gave you DNA and I asked you to make the RNA complement, it would be different, right? Okay. So practice those and make sure you know how to do it. And also make sure, sorry, also make sure that you know how to use the different DNA codon charts. They're essentially the same. You'll notice they're even in the same order. You need to know first base, second base, third base, right? But I think that's it for exam one. All righty, I'll see you after exam one is done.